Did you know that how you set up your kit is critical to whether or not you feel comfortable on the drums? If you've just gotten started on the drums or maybe you've just bought your kit and you're struggling with figuring out how in the world to adjust all the drums and the hardware and the cymbals really to your sweet spot, then today's lesson is for you. Neglect this crucial beginner step and you can practice all the things in the world and still not feel at home on your instrument. But no worries because my goal today is to simplify all of this and to show you how to adjust each component of your kit, your throne, each drum, each cymbal, and in what order to make those adjustments so that you're instantly feeling comfortable and in control of your drums. You can do this. Hey, welcome to the Non-Glamorous Drummer. I'm so glad you're hanging out today. I help you become the drummer that other people want to jam with and have in their band. And we do this by teaching you the core non-glamorous skills to get you mastering the drums and nailing songs faster. And hey, if you were with me today, I'm guessing that based on what this video is about, I'm guessing you're a beginner. Uh, you're, you're pretty new to the drums, you're getting started out. And I've got a free gift for you that I want you to go grab. This is gonna help you out so much. It's my 25 beginner grooves and fills guide, 25 beginner rock grooves and fills to be specific. And the, the whole struggle when you're starting off on the drums, I remember being in this place, was where you're trying to, you're learning some songs, you're getting started, but you just don't know what to play. Uh, you're trying to learn new kick patterns, but it's like, okay, what are they doing in this song? Okay, what are they doing in that song? You're trying to figure out what the fills are, and you're trying to learn fills, and it just feels overwhelming. So what if 95% what if of those grooves and those fills could be right here in one place? so that you can learn them all right now and then go and apply those to literally, seriously, 95% of pop, rock, country songs. Most songs you learn are gonna be built from these 25 grooves, these 25 fills. This is your cheat, this is how you get going. I literally wanna just spoon feed you some good stuff here, help you out so you can get up and running, playing the drums, playing songs, having fun more quickly. So go grab that 25 beginner rock grooves and fills to help you get started. All right, on with today's lesson. So you're just getting started, or maybe you've just bought a kit, maybe you've been playing for a little while, maybe you were playing an e-kit for a while and you've up upgraded to an acoustic kit, or maybe you've just been playing on your pad and you've now got an acoustic kit, but you're struggling to really feel comfortable playing it. Uh, and that's tough <laughs> because sometimes it feels like you're never gonna find the sweet spot. You're never gonna figure out exactly where everything needs to be. And sometimes the reason why that's happening is because we're not prioritizing the right things. Uh, you're trying to you know, get the hi-hat feeling right, but you can't really do that first because there's other things you gotta do first. And if you're trying to adjust certain things out of order, you end up compromising one thing by adjusting the other thing. And so it's like this whole puzzle where you move one part and all the other pieces move and it just becomes a mess so quickly. And that's what I've noticed working with students that easily this becomes overwhelming unnecessarily. So what I wanna do today is show you the order in which to adjust things on your kit so that you're not having to redo one thing when you fix another thing. Does that make sense? So uh, that's what we're getting into. Also, it's safe to say that um, really tall or really short people <laughs> tend to struggle the most with this, just being honest. I'm on the really tall spectrum. I'm 6'4", and I've worked with other students close to my height that have struggled with feeling comfortable to kit. And uh, I've also had really short students that are like five foot three or so. And so on either end of the spectrum, whether you're 6'4", or you're five feet, a lot of times when you're not an average height, you can't just sit down at a kit in a music store and feel comfortable. And if you do adjust your kit at home the way maybe the one at the music store was, it might not be right for you if you're really short or you're really tall. And so that's why I wanna give you these guidelines today because this is all gonna work for you, whatever your height is, because this is all based on your height, your body type, et cetera. And um, this will help you find your sweet spot. Here's the deal. Setting up a drum set comfortably for your body is not difficult when you prioritize the right components. That's what's critical, going in the right order. So, I wanna help you avoid these five mistakes because there are a lot of mistakes that are made that wreak havoc on your setup and that just make everything more confusing than they need to be. Um, so I'm gonna give you five things to do and uh, the key, the critical thing here is going in this order, making sure that you take these one by one, step by step. So, mistake number one, and this is the biggest one that I was most guilty of for the longest time, sitting too low and too close. You've got to give your legs enough room and you've got to sit high enough to be comfortable. So uh, I've seen even, I've even seen seasoned pros uh, make this mistake and I have no idea how their bodies are handling it, where they're sitting so low that their knees are higher than their hips or they're sitting so close 
that surely that's stressful on their knees, but somehow, I don't know, everybody's bodies are different. But I'm guessing if you're like me, you're going to avoid some knee pain, you're gonna avoid some ankle cramping, and you're gonna be more comfortable around your hips and your lower back if you give your leg enough space and you sit high enough. Now I'm playing heel down, so for me, I've gotta really think about you know, being far enough back so that my leg can be at this angle. Make sure that your leg is at greater than a 90 degree angle right here at the knee. If you're sitting higher, you can get away with sitting a little bit closer. So there's two ratios that I always suggest you follow, the three to one ratio and the two to one rule. And we go in depth in these in, a, in another video that I'll uh, link below. But basically when determining how far back to sit, your throne compared to the, the front of your kick, use the two to one rule. Take your height, divide it by two, and then measure that distance from the head of your kick drum to the center of your throne. And that's gonna be a great starting point for how far back to sit especially if you are playing heel down like me, because this ratio makes total sense for heel down. If you're playing heel up, then that might mean you can go a little bit closer, but that's just a good starting point. Also for determining height, use the three to one rule. So as you guess, take your height divided by three, and that's how high you want your stool to be. Now every stool is a little bit different. Some are cushier, some are firmer, and so obviously you're gonna sink into it more or less. So just that's gonna get you in the ballpark. If you're playing heel up, you can favor a little bit higher than that third of your height height that you found. Uh, if you're playing heel down, I, I'd say don't go any lower than that, but know that if you're playing heel down, you generally wanna sit a little extra further back. If you're playing heel up, you might wanna sit a little extra high. So just keep those two things in mind. But the most important two things here is, is making sure that you've got over a 90 degree angle right here and that your knee is lower than your hip. You don't wanna be sitting like this because that's gonna put so much strain back here and cause you to hunch and nothing good's gonna come of that. So if your leg is looking roughly like this, whatever your height is, where you've got greater than 90 degrees, knee is, upper leg is sloping down, you're good. All right, mistake number two, this is an interesting one. And the funny thing is, as I say this, um, mistake number two, facing toward the kick drum. If you're watching this video, you're like, well, Steven, you're facing toward your camera, which is toward the kick drum. So, okay, here's the deal. If when you're playing your drum set, if your default direction that you're facing is toward your kick drum, you're probably gonna end up having a hard time placing your hats because the truth is you've gotta to face toward your snare. Really, you've gotta face slightly to the left. So the way that I, I should be centered as I'm playing here, especially if I'm playing over here on the hats, my center, my shoulders, my torso, I should be facing this direction right here toward the direction my sticks are pointed, not actually toward the camera, not toward the kick drum. Because if I'm facing toward the kick drum, that means I'm actually twisting a little bit, but because our snare is really the center of our kit between our legs, we really logically, we need to be facing our snare. This was something I didn't think about for a long time. I remember going to a rock concert when I was in high school and the drummer in the band, he had his kit set up kind of crooked on the stage. I thought, weird, his, his drum set isn't facing the crowd. It's like facing off to his right, my left. And then he sat down at it and he was facing exactly toward the audience. So it'd be like if I turned my kit a little bit so that I can be you know, facing my drum set here, but then actually be facing you, my viewer. And so that's what he did and it, it made total sense. A lot of times when we're setting up on stages or we're setting up in a room or whatever, we put the kick drum parallel to the wall, just like I did, right? Because this is a small room, I don't have a lot of space. So that's what I did. But don't let that misguide you toward feeling like that's the center of your kit you need to face. Because when drummers try to move their snare too far this way and they're trying to face this way, things get a little bit weird. A lot of my reasoning for why you need to face the snare is gonna make more sense when we talk about hi-hat, which is gonna come up in mistake number three. But as far as snare height and snare angle, there's not a whole lot of, um, this really isn't black and white. There's a whole lot of subjectivity here. What I recommend you do, this is me. You know, if I've got my heel down right here, I like to have the rim of the snare probably about two inches above my right knee. And I like to have about a nine degree tilt. How do I know it's a nine degree tilt? Because iPhones will tell you. If you go to the measure app on an iPhone, it'll you can set it on the snare and it'll tell you the angle tilt. Don't know if that's entirely accurate, but I do find that nine degrees feels like a sweet spot to me. So as far as I know, that's still where the snare is at. And it's tilted directly toward me. And so that feels comfortable to me. It's about two inches higher than my knees if my heels are down on the pedals and it's tilted nine degrees toward me. But you can experiment with this and know that if you wanna go a little lower, that's fine. You might wanna go flatter if you go lower. If you go a little higher, you might wanna tilt it more because whatever you do, you wanna make sure your snare is at a spot where you can easily hit the center. 
comfortably, you know, just hit the center with your eyes closed or hit a rim shot with your eyes closed. A rim shot's where you're hitting the center as well as the shaft of the stick hitting the rim. A lot louder, wear ear protection for that. But make sure you can comfortably do either one. Something else to think about here that I almost forgot to mention, as far as how far away from you to have your snare, if you were 6'4 like I am, obviously it's gotta be farther away. Uh, in relation to your knees, you can see where mine's at. It's not up here in between my legs. Um, for some shorter people, that is where it ends up being. But I like having a little bit more space here to work. I don't like my snare being super close. And a big reason for that is that if the snare's really close to me, I can't play a rim shot because the butt ends of the sticks are running into my legs. So I'd rather have it a little bit further away. That way, if I play a rim shot, I can move the stick down to right here and actually play the rim shot without the butt end actually making contact with my leg. That's my personal workaround for that. Every drummer's kind of got their, their sweet spot, their way of doing that and hitting rim shots. Either you've got to have your snare higher and flatter, or you've just got to move your sticks to here to play the rim shot. Again, no right or wrongs. It's not black and white. It's just finding what works for you. And this is all about giving you guidelines and all about going in the right order. You know, we established throne height and throne position first, so you're comfortable here with your right foot. That's key, critical. Now we want to be comfortable on the snare. So one way to, to judge distance, what you wanna do is make sure if your stick is in the center of the snare and your arm is just resting right here, make sure your upper arm is pretty much just going straight down. You should be able to tell that from this camera angle. I know it's kind of a wide angle GoPro lens over here, so I don't know how accurately you can see angles, but hopefully you can tell, you know, my arm's not reaching out a bunch. It's also not back here. You don't wanna have your snare so close that your elbows are going back. You don't want, basically you want your upper arm to be sloping straight down. That's ideal and you don't wanna be having to lean forward to get to the snare. So if you can comfortably put your stick center of the snare, upper arm going straight down, that's a great sweet spot. And of course, there's a little bit of leeway there. You know, you can go a couple inches closer, that's fine. You can go a couple inches further, that's fine. So don't over scrutinize it, but just know that's a great guideline. So snare height, angle, distance away, those are some great factors to consider when finding that for your height. Mistake number three, reaching too far for the hi-hat. I, uh, I once had a student who, he would put his hi-hat so far over to the left that he was like playing like this almost, where it was just like boom, boom, ba, boom, 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 ba. And I think, I think the whole idea, it was kind of a wacky setup he had that we had to work on. I think the whole idea was getting his, his hands clear of one another. Because in theory, if you're crossing over this far, well, my sticks literally just, <laughs> my sticks literally hit right there. If you're crossing over, okay, this far, your sticks are not gonna hit each other, but it is kind of ridiculous for obvious reasons. So what's so tricky about hi-hat placement though is getting it to where we can cross over or play open-handed or play alternating on the hats and reach down to the snare. We wanna be able to do all these different things but still have our left foot comfortable and still have it in somewhat of a sweet spot. There's always a lot of compromise that has to happen. So how do we do this? So my suggestion for you is remember that we're facing we're facing our snare, and if I'm facing my snare here, I should be facing about, I'm pretty much facing toward this mic clamp right here, roughly toward the mic clamp. So if that's, we'll make this simple, get rid of that stick. This stick is going from six o'clock to 12 o'clock on my snare. So if this is 12 o'clock, then this is nine o'clock, and the hi-hat is pretty much right here at 1030. So 45 degrees from straight ahead. And it might be slightly, yeah, slightly overlapping. I don't know what you see from the overhead camera up here, but you can see that the hats are roughly, if we go straight ahead, 45 degrees to the left, 10.30 on a clock, that's where the hats are. Slightly overlapping, and I like to have them about this high. We're talking a Vic Firth stick. That's how high I like to have it. So if we set it on the snare, um, the hats are about as high as the H in Firth, which is about six inches. I recommend that six to eight inch range. I've had engineers get onto me before because my hats are too low and close to the snare mic. They always like it when you go higher. Always good to have higher cymbals to get them away from the drum mics. And also if you're playing loud rock stuff, it does, get, it does give you a little more clearance with your sticks if you've got higher hi-hats. But I also like having them lower so that I can play things like Because you get more rebound and quick response from the hats if you're playing more on top, like right here at this angle versus if you're down here. And if your hats are higher, you're having to go like this to get that angle. So your hi-hat height should be determined by what kind of style of music you're playing. If you're doing a lot of heavy digging in, you might wanna go a little higher, but if you're doing a lot of lighter playing, doing a lot of stuff kinda of like that, or that's your goal, that's the kind of stuff you want to play if you're thinking, you know, 
uh, Jeff Bracaro and Toto, Africa, Rosanna, to play those kinds of hi-hat patterns, you have to be more in this stick position and not so much like that. So having lower hats really helps with that. So that's probably really the only factor to consider in determining height. But the reason why I think this position works so well is because, again, everybody's different. So it's okay if you, you, know, you want, want to go toward 11, you might want to go toward 10, you might want to go up or down a little bit. But the reason this works so well for me and why this tends to work very well for a lot of people is that you want to be able to cross over. The goal is not to cross over hand over hand. That really doesn't actually work, even though it seems nice on paper. This really doesn't make sense. We want to cross over, but we also want to have the flexibility of moving right hand out of the way of the left stick and being able to play like this. Especially if you're playing a type of groove kind of like Rosanna. Or like Fool in the Rain, that kind of shuffle pattern. When you're playing grooves like that, it can be really helpful to have left stick free to move up and down independent of the right hand and so to move your right stick out here. Now for playing normal basic rock stuff, I like to default to right here. So the reason this is my sweet spot is because I can default to right here or I can go out to here if I'm playing something busier with the right hand that still requires a lot of heavy, loud, big stick motions with the left hand. Now something else critical here, and we've got a lesson specifically on this I'll link below, is using the windshield wiper motion. That's what I like to call it because when you're playing backbeats on the snare, you've got to have some stick height. You can't play like this. Otherwise the snare just isn't loud enough. You've got to hit the snare harder to match your, your hi-hat volume here that your right hand is hammering out. So you've got to lift the right stick out of the way enough to allow the left stick to move. Like that, if we go slow motion, it's literally just creating this motion, lifting the stick up, opening the gate. It's just like windshield wipers, so this one moves out of the way, so this one can move up. Practice doing that. There's more detail on that in a separate lesson I'll link in the description. But that's also really critical. When you can do that, it really doesn't matter if your hi-hats are in the perfect spot or not. And so then from there, you can see, okay, what makes sense for my left foot? Is it too close? Okay, let me go a little bit further away. And so you're able to have a little bit of imperfection there with your hi-hat positioning when you get in the habit of clearing space like that. And of course, you can sit here and play and test out different things and move it around just a little bit. And from there, you can find your sweet spot. But again, as always, remember that we're starting with throne height and position, therefore kick drum, that's the fundamental. Then we're getting comfortable with the snare, then moving the hi-hat in. Don't scramble that order or else you're gonna have a mess. But at this point, if you've gotten comfortable with right foot, you've gotten comfortable with, comfortable with your snare, which is the center of your kit that you're gonna hit a whole bunch of times in any style of music, and you're comfortable with your hi-hat, even if your left leg doesn't have as much space as your right, which mine doesn't, that's what you'll see here, that the hi-hat pedal is significantly closer than the kick pedal, that's a compromise I've had to make. But it's fine because I'm playing mostly heel up on the hi-hat, and because I'm playing heel up on the hats, I can have them a little bit closer. I can go heel down too, but I'm not doing the kind of playing with my left foot that my right foot is, where we wanna have this open, loose motion down here. It's more of a leg bounce kind of thing that I'm doing a lot over here. Again, topic for another lesson. There's a lot of, lot of directions we can go with this, a lot of helpful stuff for you here on the channel if you are a beginner. But know that that's a compromise you'll have to make. The hi-hat pedal probably can't be as far away from you as the kick drum pedal, otherwise the hats are just too far. So you've gotta find that compromise point. But at this point, this is the majority of the kit. Yes, there's other components, we'll talk about those, but if you've got kick, snare, hats in place, that's probably 80%. So if we're following the 80-20 rule, hey, that's 80% of it right there. We're gonna call it 80%. But hey, two more mistakes, numbers four and five we wanna get through, talking about toms and cymbals. Mistake number four, uh, a lot of drummers make this mistake, and it's, uh, it's kind of an honest one. The rack tom is too high. So the reason I say this is an honest mistake is because with some kits, you literally can't get the rack tom low enough. And so the rack tom's stuck up here on top of a 24 inch bass drum. And because it's, you know, like an eighties or nineties kit, the rack tom's like this deep. And so it's like sticking way out over here. And so you're having to go boom, 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 boom. Okay, go, go, ding, 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 ding. Okay, go, go. To get up there to your rack tom. I've played kits like that and it just feels so ridiculous. And so work as hard as you can with whatever kit you've got or whatever kit you're playing on. Cause this also applies to you. If you're playing gigs, you're playing on house kits and you're having to adjust the house kit. I have to do this all the time. See if you can move the rack tom this way a little bit, away from the snare, enough that you can lower it, 
and then angle it enough. The goal is to get this rim right here no more than two or three inches from the snare. Fight for that. Do the best you can because think about the majority of places you're going to go from your snare. If you're playing a groove and you're going to go into a fill that goes to the toms, most likely, 95% of the time, you're going to go to that rack tom first. Sure, you could hit the floor tom. There's no rules. But most of the time when you're moving from the snare to somewhere else, you know, other than the hi-hat or the crash, you're probably moving to the rack tom. And so many fills are based off of that. And if you can't go... If you can't play that kind of pattern comfortably, that's going to be tough. You need to be able to do that without worrying about that without stabbing a rack tom. Man, I remember doing that so many times on kits where I couldn't get the rack tom where I wanted it or I didn't try hard enough. We don't wanna, we don't wanna have to worry about that. Be able to sit there and go, you know, smoothly arcing the stick from drum to drum and practicing that maneuvering motion so that it's nice and smooth and get, get that rack tom as low and angled as you can. You can see the angle mine's at. It's not a super steep angle. We want to be able to hit it square on. Remember, when, when we hit a drum, we don't want it to be tilted so steep that we're hitting it like this. If that makes sense. Because if we have a super steep angle, then it means we're hitting the drum at an angle. We want our stick to hit the drum square on. So think about what angle does your rack tom need to be at for you to hit it square on. Get it low enough and angle just right so that you can do that. That's a great way to gauge it. You know, if you extend your arm here and you hit your rack tom, is the stick landing like that or is it landing like that because it's too high or too tilted? Just think about it logically. Practice playing back and forth between them. Pretty monotonous, but hey, that's great practice in motion and movement and steady singles and uh, in playing fills cleanly. So always something worth practicing. And as for the floor tom, so I moved it out of the frame over here. Uh, so you could see my leg a minute ago talking about throne placement. But if we get this back in place, let's see. Always a little bit of a puzzle because of uh, the rack tom stand, which by the way, don't worry about symbols until you've taken care of the toms first. But once we get the rack tom in place, let me tell you a little bit about why I have it positioned the way I do. I like to have my floor tom a little bit lower than my snare, which some drummers think is odd. They sit down in my kit and they're like, why is your floor tom so low? Well, here's the rationale. On the snare, we want to be able to play rim shots anytime. We want to play in the center, we want to play rim shots, and we don't want our snare so low that we're like having to lean down to it. I know some drummers do that, I don't. But our floor tom, we specifically don't want to play rim shots on. Uh, we, we want to make sure we're hitting in the center. No, there's pretty much no cases where you want to play a rim shot on the floor tom. Maybe if you're playing Latin music, but for the most part, we want to hit the center and not accidentally hit the rims. And if you have a bigger floor tom, this is a 14 inch. If you have a 16 or 18 inch and you accidentally hit a rim shot, depending on where you're gripping your stick, you might also accidentally smash a finger between the stick and the rim of the floor tom. <laughs> That's painful. Uh, I've been there. We want to avoid that. And so we want to make sure we're always striking the tom at enough of an angle here with the stick that we don't accidentally play a rim shot. And if it's a big drum, we don't accidentally smash an index finger underneath the stick. And so that's why I like to have my, my floor tom a little bit lower. And it just makes sense. You know, when you're going, go, 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 go. when you're going down, when you're starting here and you're going down, you're, you're, you know, you're right here in your center and then you're kind of moving up to the rack tom. Doesn't it make sense to work your way down? I don't think it makes sense for a floor tom to be higher than the snare. That would just be weird. We want to be able to work our way down around the kit. Um, that may or may not make sense to you. You may or may not agree with me, but I think the, the whole avoiding rim shots, avoiding finger smashes, and working our way down, that's why I want to have this floor tom right here where it's at. And also I'm thinking about, okay, if I hit my snare right here in the center and I move my hand over to here, where's the stick landing? If I were to do this and the stick lands right here, okay, that means the floor tom needs to go further that way. Or if I were to do this and the stick's landing right here, okay, the floor tom needs to come further this way. So sit here and practice going like this and say, okay, where does my floor tom want to be? Where does it actually want to be? Not where I think it ought to be, but where does it need to be based on this motion right here? Because a lot of times when you're playing fills, As you're learning fills like that and you're playing a lot of quick tom stuff like that, you want to just, you want to have your toms within easy reach where that left stick naturally wants to go right there. Right stick naturally wants to go right here. 
so that with your eyes closed, at least you're somewhat close to the center of the drums. And so practice that motion and let that show you, let that guide you toward exactly where your, your floor tom should be. Also, I've got my floor tom tilted a little bit. It's really tilted toward the snare because you don't necessarily want to have it tilted toward you. You could, but think about where you're going from the floor tom and think about where you're coming from when you go to the floor tom. Most of the time, we're going around the kit and we're going from rack tom to floor tom. So we really want to have our rack tom tilted down this way. We really want to have our floor tom kind of tilted this way. It'd be a little weird for floor tom to be tilted up that direction. You kind of have to find the, the medium here. I think mine's tilted directly toward the snare. That way it feels about right from right here, and I feel like I can easily go back and forth between the toms or back and forth between snare and floor tom. It's all about having the drums kind of angled toward each other in a way. It's not really a bowl, but that's kind of the way we want to think, where we always want to be thinking in terms of going from one place to the other and have them as close together as we can get them. There's no reason to have the drums way spread apart. Have things within easy reach for quick navigation so that you can flow around the kit much more easily. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up with mistake number five. And honestly, this is the least critical mistake. This is still something we're talking about, but we've, we've covered the most important things here. Mistake number five, symbols not placed for optimum striking angle. So we wanna adjust our symbols to taste. Where do they feel comfortable for you? There's, there's really not, there are not hard and fast rules here. Like literally, you can move your symbols around a whole bunch and it still be fine. Here's the important um, principle that uh, I wanna hammer home here. You wanna make sure your symbols are at the right height and angle for you to strike them at the right angle, uh, not a right angle like that. The correct angle, that's the better word for it. Because if you're striking your crash symbol too steeply, you're gonna get more of a, uh, like a clang and an impact than a nice smooth swell. Uh, vice versa, if you're striking your symbol like this, you're gonna get more of that, that sound rather than a nice smooth swell. So you've gotta be somewhere in between. Make sure that your symbols are placed so that naturally without thinking about it, you're striking with the shoulder of your stick at a slight angle, not too steep, because also if you're hitting really hard, really steep, that could dent or crack a cymbal, especially if they're not really high-end cymbals, or if they're thinner, darker cymbals, they can be prone to cracking, and so you wanna be careful. But if you, if you aim for this sweet spot, where it's more of a into the cymbal like this, rather than into the cymbal like that, because that's not gonna do anything, but this that gets the cymbal moving, that will. And so you wanna adjust your cymbals to strike them like this. That's pretty much enough said. You know, We could talk about this all day and the nuance and all of that. But that's the same with hi-hats. That's how we're determining hi-hat height. We wanna be able to strike them at a slight angle. Be able to dig in a little more too, but for the most part, this is where we wanna be. And so we wanna be high enough to do that, but not so high that we're going like that. And the same thing applies for the ride too. The difference with the ride is that most of the time we're playing on top of it. And so we might wanna have it a little lower or angled a little bit more, but still, unless you're playing like a, a ZBT rock ride or like one of those super pingy, Boston more than a feeling. That's the kind of ride I'm thinking of. The, the ride in Boston more than a feeling. That ride probably would not wash very well. It's just a pingy ride. And you're not gonna hit it this way. But I personally love rides that you can crash to. And this is a really nice dark washy kind of crash ride here that's really cool. Uh, this is a K Custom Dark, uh, cust yeah. K Custom Dark 20 inch ride, I love it. Optimize the angle and the height for playing on top. And also make sure it's not so far away that you can't reach the bell. So yeah, your arm's gotta extend, but that's okay. You're not gonna live on the bell most of the time. If you find you are, you can always move it closer. But adjust it so that you can play at this angle just as comfortably as at this angle. And so you can go down and crash it, and go up and play on the surface. There's so much room to play around here. And so that's why, that's why this is number five and not number one. The most important things, remember, throne, snare, hats. And then the toms, which is important when you're wanting to navigate around the kit well and feel at home. But feeling at home really starts with the throne, honestly. Throne height and, and kick placement and all of that. Symbols are just icing on the cake. So that's all we're gonna talk about for symbols. Make sure you've got that optimum striking angle so you're not hitting them like this, but that you're hitting them like this. Um, same with the ride, because uh, it's just gonna feel better that way. You're gonna get a better sound that way. So. What's next? Let me give you four final thoughts to leave you with, kind of four tips going forward. First one is this, don't be afraid to make adjustments as you go because your setup is going to change a whole bunch over the coming years. Five years from now, your drum set is gonna look totally different than it does today. And that's okay, that's just the way it is. Second thing, don't be afraid to mark your hardware spots on the carpet. 
especially if you're setting up on a drum rug or if you're at the point in your playing where you're starting to gig and you're starting to set your kit up in other places, that can be really helpful just to mark on the drum rug where things go. It'll make your setup a lot quicker. But don't be afraid to do that at home. Just mark where you've got everything. That way, when you move things around, when you're experimenting, you won't be afraid to move things around for one thing. Uh, you'll always know where they were, but also you'll be able to see over time how much your setup morphs. That's what I've noticed because I've had things marked here and like I don't have it exactly on the tape right now. It gradually morphs. You know, even if you're 18 years old plus and you're, you're done growing and you're as tall as you're going to be, I think I finally stopped growing at like 17. Um, <laughs> you're still gonna gradually adjust the way you have your kit set up over the years, and that's fine. It's hard to explain why. I think it's just we, we find certain things work better, and we move that an inch that way, and that an inch that way, and we try going up, try going down, and eventually it, it gets more and more comfortable over time. So don't be afraid to experiment. Know that um, you, know, you can mark your, your hardware spots on the, on the carpet with some tape if you want to. Um, also, number three, always spend time playing before making big adjustments and test out those adjustments with your eyes closed. So really what this boils down to is adjust your kit not based on what looks right, but what feels like, what feels right. Kind of what we were talking about with the floor tom, where it might look kind of funny to have the floor tom lower than the snare or to have it tilted a little toward the snare, but think about, okay, maybe that doesn't look right. Maybe other drummers think it's weird, but does it feel right? If I'm going back and forth a lot, well, that kind of makes sense. That feels right now if I'm sitting here going like this. And so anytime you're thinking about making an adjustment, test it out by playing some with your eyes closed and just ask, does this make sense? Uh, is my arm having to reach too far or does this feel right? Am I having to lean or twist too far? What makes sense? It's that simple. You know, just use common sense here and don't overcomplicate it. Whatever's comfortable is whatever is right right now and you might change your mind later. Um, final thought is know that kit setup and ergonomics is a process and not an event, so be patient. Because something that's also gonna happen, the better your hand technique gets, which I hope you're also working on, we got tons of lessons here on Non-Glamorous Drummer to help you with that. The better your hand technique gets, the smoother your motions get around the kit. And what's really cool is that the more you're able to smoothly move around the kit, the more you're able to sit down at a kit that's not perfectly optimized for you and still sound good on it and still play well. Because when your hands are comfortable, you can really have a lot of control over where your sticks go. So the more you're working on that, and the more you're working on your coordination, the more in control and the more comfortable you will be behind any kit, even if it's not perfectly set up. The reason why this is so critical for a beginner is because you do need to feel some level of comfort when you're starting out. And so getting your kit set up right, that is the best way to instantly feel a lot more comfort on the drums. But know that that comfort and confidence will increase over time. And as your motions get better, you're able to glide around the kit and hit things smoothly. It won't matter if things aren't perfectly set up. So know that this is a process, not an event. Be patient with it and know that you're only going to get more comfortable over time. It always works that way. You will always get more comfortable over time. And if that's not what's happening, we'll just reevaluate, just readjust, find what's comfortable and uh, stick, with, stick with the process, be okay with it. So question for you today as we go, what are you going to change about your setup right now? I hope that uh, this has inspired you to do an audit of your kit. If you've been playing for a little while, you've got your kit set up, then do an audit of how you have everything adjusted. If you're brand new and you're setting up your kit today with me, awesome, you can get started on the right foot. But if you're sitting down at your kit now and you're like, well, you know what? I don't think my hi-hat position really does make sense. Or, you know what, I'm actually sitting way too low or too close. I, just, I want you to ask those questions, even if it's not comfortable to ask those questions, even if you don't want to make changes and you're like, oh, maybe it's fine the way it is. It's probably fine. I won't worry about it. Don't be afraid to make the changes. Film yourself playing. Put a camera over here. Film yourself playing. Put a camera over here. Film yourself playing. Like one video at a time. You don't have to have multiple cameras. Make individual videos, moving the camera different places around the room so you can watch yourself playing. And if you see that, you know, actually that looks kind of weird, fix it. So what are you going to fix right now? Do an audit on your kit, find what you're going to change. And uh, I hope this helps you out. I hope this has been super valuable to you. I know this has been a pretty a long nitty gritty kind of lesson, but um, these tend to be really helpful or so I hear. So I hope this has been helpful for you and valuable to you. Be sure to grab that 25 Practical Rock Grooves and Fills Guide. If you're a beginner, that's just going to spoon feed you some awesome stuff to help you get up and running quickly. Go grab that. I will see you on the next video. Stay non-glamorous. Know that as always, you can do this.